good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Macbeth, and I'm bringing you Dude's Squawk number seven on behalf of Osfrank Theatre Film. As you can see, I'm in the environ of Dunsinane Castle, and just behind me is Burner Wood. So today I'd like to talk about the similarities between the film director Stanley Kubrick and the theatre director Tadashi Suzuki, whom I've worked with and known for nearly 20 years. Uh, Kubrick is much more famous than Tadashi Suzuki, but actually within the connoisseurs in their respective fields, they both are held in probably pretty much equal esteem. And I believe that really the, the two have tremendous amount in common, especially in the way they interrogate what they're doing. Both of them are highly individualised auteurs and really take a lot of interest, deep interest, one could say an obsession, with all the elements of what they're doing, whether in Kubrick's case it's film, in Suzuki's case it's theatre. Kubrick, of course, is, is well known for films such as 2001, Space Odyssey, Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, Eyes Wide Shut, um, Dr. Strangelove, and probably Lolita. So name those sort of six or seven great, great films which he really carved out a tremendous reputation. Suzuki has been going in much the same time since 1960s and is actually still going to this present day. So he's actually, Kubrick died in 1999 and Suzuki continues very much. And I guess you could say they interrogate their work in separate ways. Kubrick did it with each film. So when he did something like Clockwork Orange, it was actually a very, very separate experience from something like 2001 or Barry Lyndon or anything that followed either, either before or after. Suzuki is quite different in a sense because he's dealing with live theater then, of course, he's actually interrogated his work, not in separate experiences, but in one continuous experience. So, for instance, something like King Lear, which I've seen five versions of, he's been interrogating that piece of theatrical attitude to Shakespeare for a period of 20-plus years uh, in various incarnations. But both of them share this incredible sense of really getting into the work and actually wearing out the work itself. So I tend to use the description that they, they, they're actually taking the number of takes that Kubrick does or with the time that Suzuki spends on each production, the development of each production is a form of erosion and erosion in the case of Kubrick with all his, his takes, it's erosion of the ego of the actor and I believe he goes even further actually erodes the ego of the film itself and Suzuki likewise it erodes the ego of the actor by repetition of course that's a Japanese thing in terms of water dripping on a stone wearing it out, wearing it out, wearing it out. So we're left with all, we've, we've removed all the false ornamentation and we're left with, say, a core value, a core content. And Kubrick did this in film by just taking up to 127 takes. So repetition, repetition, repetition. And that enables the actual actor to not only sort of learn his lines or learn, know their lines, but actually to go to beyond knowing their lines well to actually a, p a point of, I guess, relinquishment. So their, their ego just says, I'm sick of this, I've done this so many times, and I don't want to do it again. The spirit then continues and pushes forward, so you get this other thing going on. Now, for instance, if you look at one of the sequences in The Shining, a movie I didn't mention, Jack Nicholson's about to walk into the bar, which of course in this case is empty, and he talks to this imaginary figure of the barman, and they have this conversation. But as he walks up towards the camera, before he turns right in, left into the, the film, he does this sort of shoulder shrug, he does this one thing. And I believe that's a sort of element that something like Kubrick found very, very attractive. And that's why he kept that take in. Now, I'm not sure how many takes it was, but I believe what he's looking for and shares with Suzuki is this thing that's the same, but it's also different. And you could argue it's in the space between same and different. And by doing a number of takes, you get this unknown thing going on where the actor's doing the same stuff, same stuff, same stuff, but actually there's something about it that's actually a bit different each time. Now Kubrick would, would actually, I believe, and I don't know, but I, I, I imagine he's looking at all these takes, just interrogating that take and seeing that's got something there, and that's something there, and that's something there. But rather than just being happy if it all sort of added up, he wants to get to this other space, so something's actually inside that, that shot, that sequence, that's actually this other thing going on. There's all these accepted things, 
the lines are right, the lighting's right, the camera tracking's right, etc., etc., etc. But another, another thing happens, and it's that magical sort of mystery thing that I believe he sort of searches for. And you actually can see the product in the actual end result of the film, where these these little things happen, which actually give it a nuance, an edge, a shift, a slight shift, a slight rotational shift in the actual the thing you're watching. Okay, so. And I, I think you can only do that if you actually just do it again and again and again and again and again. Such that the actors are sick of it, the technicians are sick of it, everybody's sick of it except for the director who actually wants this other thing going on. So he's actually looking further and further into it. And Kubrick, I think, had this thing of sort of going deep, deep, deep. And Suzuki likewise. When he's rehearsing, he might repeat something a num number of times over a number of days, over a number of weeks, over a number of years. By doing that, the false ornamentation just ablates away. And we left with this key thing. But not only this key thing, it's not just core. It's actually got a sense of mystery about it too, because this other thing starts to happen. This other thing starts to envelop the work itself. Way beyond the just the sort of the strictures of the actual language, the strictures of the style, the strictures of the actual rhythm, this other story goes on. Mystery. So that's one thing I believe they share in common. The other thing is actually their use of music both of them extremely perspicacious in the way they use music. Kubrick obviously well known for such things as um, Zausos Back Zarathustra for the beginning of 2001. That's a very strange piece of music by Richard Strauss but then he'll balance that in the film with something like the Blue Danube Waltz which he'll use for the balletic sequences of the, the the spaceships moving in outer space. So you get this incredible sense of dance about it. It's a dance, it's very stately, it's very, very, um, very, very classic and very calm and beautiful as it is in it. Just there's no noise in space. That's, that's, that, that's some of the elements. Also, when he uses something like when he was doing Clockwork Orange, there's a sequence for the, the harassment of, I think, it's Miriam Carlin. And Apparently, Malcolm McDowell, the only song he knew was actually Singing in the Rain. Could be said, sing a song while you're doing this sort of harassment sequence or beating up sequence. And the only one he knew was actually Singing in the Rain, so he sang. So, of course, that very, very strange introduction of a theme from a, a musical based in 1938, which is very much happy, happy go lucky thing against the context of the actual gruesome nature of the actual content means that as you're watching it, you're actually caught in the space between the same and different, the same, the stuff that's obvious, and also that this different thing that's going on, this nuance that happens. And of course, what you're hearing and what you're seeing are very discordant. So that causes a sort of a shift in the way you perceive it. Suzuki likewise will use those sorts of things. But he actually goes further because he actually used music choreographically. And I'd like to give you two instances of that. One is the, this, they're both from the uh, the uh, Edmund Rostand play Cyrano de Bergerac and Suzuki does this very classic romantic um, version of it set in late 19th century Japan so it's got all these samurai instead of soldiers in French revolutionary France we have samurai with the swords and in a way to introduce the piece he starts off with a traviata overture from Tra the music he uses for this piece by the way is traviata by Verdi so he uses several sequences, three or four sequences from the actual, the opera by Verdi. Um, none singing, they're all the musical interludes. And the first one he uses is the, is the um, prelude. And the prelude of Traviata is very Wagnerian, it's very spatial, it's got a lot of very slow moving chords. And he has the, the women in the company walking on in med, mini wedding kimonos, they're br bright white kimonos. And they've got white parasols, or black gloves or white gloves, and hats, They're looking very beautiful, and they come on stage. And during the whole opening sequence, they, they enter from side stage, and gradually, with this about a minute and a half of the first sequence from this music, actually has a stop to it. It actually comes to a stop. And what Suzuki's done as his choreographed is the women walk on very slowly, very slowly, and as the piece comes to the stop, and the first sequence comes to the stop, they actually accelerate ever so slightly, and then they actually finish at the end of the space. And at the same moment in the science, they open the umbrellas very, very briskly. So here's this incredible sense of actually making the space. He's used this, the, the way that the actors 
the actors move by actually making the space boom. And it's like he's made space with sound and action. It's very, really, very, very beautiful and quite uncanny in the sense that it creates this very special feeling. The other thing he uses music for is this, he tends to use music to create a juxtaposition between what's actually happening, the content and the context. So for instance, when the, there's a drinking song, the Biamo, which I'm playing now, and it's a beautiful sense of a 4-3, but it's got this very great lilt to it, it's a very dancing piece. And the men are sitting on their, their, ta their stools, their little tatami mats, and the, as the music starts, they say, Kampai. The women are sitting right next to them, and the women are sitting one leg on the chair, and they're looking very, 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 very cool, calm, and very sort of porcelain-like purity. Men toss take the swords out and they start to leer at these women. They leer at the women and start to go, these pull faces and this, they get up and they start flashing the dance, the, the, the blades around. And they look, and the women meanwhile start to do very slowly rise on the chairs. And the men look as though not only they're going to rape them, they're going to kill them, they're going to actually completely destroy them, to shatter them. The men do this incredible braggadocio, it's very masculine and very, very um, machismo. And then there's an incredible sense of refined feminine purity. And they rise up. And as in the course of this sequence, which probably goes for two minutes, the men never touch the women. So this, this threat is actually, uh, so, um, it's, well, it's, um, impotence, impotence. So, what he's done is he created sort of a metaphor for the actual meaning of the play because the play is about the impotence of Cyrano, Cyrano de Bergerac. And so he's done this amazing thing. So instead of showing sort of sex in a very crude fashion or an uncrude fashion, he's taken the sort of the female element, the aspect of femininity and the aspect of masculinity, and he's actually separated them. So the women are incredibly pure, the men are incredibly rough, and they never touch. Now, so you could say he's abstracted these essences, the sexual essences between the two, the two sexes, male and female. He's abstracted them such a way, but what he's also done, and what gives it such density and such gravitas, such depth and weight, is the fact that the, both the actors, the females and the males, do this with such incredible self-definition. Self that you've got this dialectic between the self-definition and the simplicity of the actors and the incredibly abstract nature of the, of the actual the theme of what they're doing. And it's a phenomenal piece of context and content. And he is incredibly, a really great choreographer, not so much in steps, but in this context and this relationship between, between the actual the content and the, the space it's in. So Kubrick, I guess, can't really do that because you can't do that in film in the same way as you can in theatre. You just don't get the time to do that. I mean, he would use the camera as, as an extra actor, I suppose. But this sense, incredible sense of time and Kubrick's use of the way time actually wears the film out. It wears the actors out. It wears all the technicians out. Everyone gets worn out except, of course, him. He's quite happy when th such things as, for instance, in, in The Shining, one of the sets burnt down and actually had to sort of shut down production for a few months. He was very happy about that because that actually allowed him to actually think a lot more and to get a sense of actually cogitate and look at what am I looking for, what do I want. Um, uh, both of them, I believe, also have what I would call an, an aesthetic insight. There's many film directors who produce a magnificent product, say Hitchcock for one, tremendous sense of understanding of the way cinema works, and also their sense of, I guess, landscape and time. You know, Hitchcock's uh, North by Northwest is a great sense of all these landscapes that he throws out to the, 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 the fields with the crop duster, and then of course the Frank Lloyd Wright um, building, and then of course Mount Rushmore. But I don't believe he offers the same, what I would call, aesthetic insight that something like Kubrick does. When you look at Kubrick, if you look at something like 2001, the spaceship looks incredibly potentially now. If you look at Hitchcock, it always looks like then. 
it looks like 1945, 1948, whenever it was done. But, but Kubrick, because of his sense of wearing out the film, will actually identify these, these sort of aesthetic truths inside the, the module, whatever it might be. And actually, so and it always looks now. It always looks as it could be happening now as well. And I think he shares with Suzuki this thing, what I would call an aesthetic insight. And that's born of, of not being satisfied with what it is. There's a great sequence, great, great story from uh, Dr. Strangelove where they had this big green table, the war room. And th there's two stories about this. One, one, one is about the, 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 the type of cloth on the table. It's, um, a, it went a green baize table, so it looked like a, a gambling, a gambling, a poker, poker table at a high stakes thing. Because he says, well, that's war is gambling, so, etc. And apparently they point out, well, this is a black and white film, Stanley. Well, they said, I don't care, I want a green table because I want to have the right feel. Now, you could argue this is pointless because it doesn't come out. But actually, that demand actually somehow it densifies the film itself. And so his demand that his designs would do this or that, he'd keep doing it. And it's the same way. It has demand on the actors and the set and, and, and the crew. But it actually means it's always more defined and it's always moving towards greater self-definition, becoming more of itself and more of an aesthetic statement with the full idiosyncrasy idiosyncrasy uh, that an auteur like Suzuki or Kubrick has. So that, that's part of the other story about this um, Dr. Strangelove is that this thing called the war room that Kubrick actually invented. Well, apparently when Ronald Reagan became president of the United States, he wanted to sort of see the war room. <laughs> and uh, it was pointed out to him, there's no such thing as a war room. And so that shows you that this sort of thing actually became a myth in itself. And so Suzuki's not Suzuki's, Kubrick's incredible vision of that circular space, the circular lights, this massive sort of a backlit uh, map of the world which had all these sort of dots on it. But it's so convincing that people actually thought it, the real thing would look like this. In fact, it doesn't, apparently. Um, but I think that shows you that he has actually aesthetic insight. I would say he shares that with Orson Welles too, who in many ways, when he did Citizen Kane or his version of Macbeth, Othello, Chimes at Midnight, has the same sort of aesthetic insight. And that actually, that actually implies much more than just some sort of realistic reenactment, but something that actually has the reenactment part, but actually densifies that to some other space. And uh, that's where Kubrick and Suzuki are you know, really on their own. Um, I know Suzuki because I've worked with him for such a long time and seen his work over such a long time. Uh, Kubrick I know obviously by watching the films many times so I've had the same experience with both and I really believe they share that sense of interrogation aesthetic insight a choreographic nature both choreographic so it's much more than just a visually putting on stuff there's actually a spatial interaction between all the elements and I'd say this choreographic in Kubrick's case it's the, the camera the use of the camera is actually choreographic uh, when he did The Shining he um used the Steadicam which had been invented by the, for the very first time. In fact, the, I think the man who invented the Steadicam actually was in a shop. So all that stuff, the little tricycles speeding around the place, that was the first time it could ever be done. And that's using the camera as, as a dancer, I suppose. So thank you for allowing me to share that with you. And um, I'm going to call that quits now. So that was the end of this word number seven. And that's sign now just as a Airbus flies overhead. Thank you very much.